Hello everybody and welcome to the variable resistance uh, live stream. <laughs> I'm still getting my bearings here. So bear with me um, and this first time since this is brand new for me. Um, I'm hoping that this will be uh, an informative way for you guys to, well, informative, I don't know. I hope it's fun. I hope you guys um, have something to do while you eat lunch on Tuesday afternoon. Um, so really what this is about, uh, if you didn't go to variableresistance.org, is um, just a place for me to sort of document some of the stuff that I'm working on. Um, talk a little bit about uh, my process and, um, you know, hopefully have a discourse with people um, and, you know, have a time for uh, answering questions and I'm hoping to eventually uh, have other people on this as well, people who are actually experts in the field. Um, as I mentioned in the post, um, I am very much a generalist. Um, if you look at all of this stuff behind me, you will see a random assortment of uh, randomness. <laughs> Anything from, you know, um, doing a lot of electronics, do a lot of programming, um, also interested in photography, um, pretty much anything is an uh, open area for me to explore. Um, I get sucked in on things quite easily. So um, with that in mind, uh, I just wanted to have a place to be able to document some of the things that I'm doing. Uh, work on a lot of things and then they just disappear and they get lost on my desk and um, they don't really ever come back out uh, <laughs> of the mess again. So I'm hoping that um, by sharing some things, that uh, other people will hopefully share some things as well, and uh, everybody's level of interest, a level of uh, knowledge increases. So, um, with that said, I guess, um, disclaimers, uh, I may do some things that are dangerous occasionally, I don't know, probably not, but maybe, I might just do them for fun. So, disclaimer being, I'm not responsible for whatever you do down the road with that information. Um, or I guess, yeah, I'm empowering you, but I'm not, I'm not the one that's gonna do it, so it's up to you. Um, and uh, along with that, I'm probably gonna take, uh, I'm gonna break this into little 20 minute chunks. Um, sometimes these will be really short, sometimes these will be um, longer, just depending on what the, the subject matter is. Um, you're noticing I'm wearing headphones. Might not always be doing that, but it's sort of a tradition in the live streaming community as far as I can tell so far. And uh, it helps me know that um, I am not blaring um, random noise at you instead of you hearing my lovely voice, which is um, very sleep inducing. So I hope you get a good nap if nothing else. Um, let's see, what else did I want to mention? There was something I keep looking behind me, like there's something behind me to mention. Um, just other housekeeping things. Um, by all means, um, subscribe to Justin TV, which is what I'm going to be using for now. If you uh, have any questions during the cast, feel free to put them in the chat room. Uh, I'm trying to keep track of that. My second monitor here. Um, so, by all means, I'm happy to go off on a tangent if need be. Um, You'll also notice I'm in a shared space, so there might be some other noise occasionally. Um, that's the way it is here in the city. So um, yeah, so uh, let's jump right into it. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about just the process of doing this first because half the reason I'm doing this is because I think it's interesting to um, self-broadcast. I think um, this whole idea of live streaming is really interesting. Um, more and more people are doing it. I'm interested in the, what the gaming community is doing. Um, they obviously have like a content stream to pull from where they can just play a game and uh, people can watch them play the game and kind of interact with that. And uh, it's interesting to see how, uh, how many people are sort of getting into that. Um, so, yeah, probably won't be playing any games here, but um, who knows. Uh, I am in the process of building some games. I'm hoping to um, talk about that some. I also do a lot of uh, various programming on uh, phones, on um, other platforms, 
So I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, it's very nerdy, of course, uh, but that's what this is all about. So um, I'll probably be talking about some programming concepts here and there, um, and also just about cha various challenges that I'm facing. Um, as I'm not, you know, I'm not officially schooled in um, game design or uh, some of these, you know, you're always learning when you're building uh, applications or doing installations. Um, otherwise, really, if you're not learning, you're probably doing a project that is not all that fun and not really challenging you. So uh, that's usually my, um, my mark for whether or not I'm actually doing something fun, interesting. Okay, so um, let's kick into it here. I, I'm going to show you just a little bit of my setup. Um, I'm, on, I'm on a Mac. A lot of people that do this stuff are on PCs and use uh, a program called XSplit. Um, but I like the Mac environment. There's a great program called CamTwist that is out there um, that allows you to essentially do uh, multi-broadcasting or multi-channel broadcasting on the computer. Um, it has a whole suite of tools. Um, I can, you know, switch from uh, the cam you're just watching to uh, this is a webcam that's attached to the top of my computer. I can also switch to the camera that's inside of my computer. I'm using this because it has a nice little swivel area so I can, um, you know, quickly show you something with my hands, whatnot, uh, and be able to click back to the lovely look at my face uh, view. Um, also, when we start getting into concepts on the computer, uh, I can flip into uh, sort of a view of everything on the screen. Uh, we could, you know, go into some programming concepts or um, I'll show you guys some websites um, regarding our topics for today, uh, as well as, you know, still have some of these other views available. So, um, you know, these are really great tools. It also allows me to sort of cut everything out when I need to, um, which we'll do here in a few minutes uh, when we take a break. Um, and, you know, you're off and running. Uh, when we, you know, if I have some video content or other things like that, uh, it's a great way to show that as well. So, um, as far as other parts of the setup, I'm going to flip back. This is, I'm not going to be doing this very often, but um, just show you uh, some of the other things I'm using. I have a very simple mixer, which I have on a little uh, modified monitor stand um, that's feeding in the microphone and uh, uh, sound from the computer. Um, which is handy so that I can kind of keep track of that. Um, also using a uh, DPX100 to, as my main uh, camera. And uh, then I have sort of a dual setup display so that I can see what's going on in the chat. Um, yeah, so let me get this back on here a little bit better. And I'll flip back to this main cam. Um, yeah, so otherwise, uh, lots of tools here, uh, hoping to use them a little bit more in the process of um, doing this cast, uh, as well as, um, you know, of course, if there's ever anything you see behind me, if there's any, ever anything that I'm kind of talking about that you want to hear more about, um, you know, uh, definitely wanting to uh, get those comments from you. Uh, I want this to be sort of a two-way thing uh, as much as possible. So. Uh, I'm also looking at the chat and seeing that um, there's a request for pretzels, so I'll see what I can do about that next time around. Um, oh wait, yeah, you saw the pretzels and they're right here. I forgot, they're hiding. I, I hid all my food before the stream thinking they won't see that spot over there. Well, very perceptive of you. Um, <laughs> glad I could help out that random person in the chat. Okay, so um, let's just jump right in. Um, so to not be uh, techie at all, or I guess to be uh, technologically savvy if you were in, um, you know, 3000 BC, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about gardening. And, um, you know, I grew up in a small town in Idaho for the most part, and um, I was forced to work in a garden all the time. And I hated it, and I was just so ready to get to a city and not do any of that, not have to mow the lawn or any of that kind of stuff. And now I find myself in a city, you know, 
many, many years later. And um, realizing, hey, that's kind of an interesting way to escape all of this um, tech stuff I do all the time. And uh, it's free food once you, once you get you know, to that point. So I've um, been sort of planning a garden. Uh, my lovely girlfriend, uh, her father is very into it. He's been very helpful as well as my parents, of course, um, gave me maybe some wisdom back in the day that I'm slowly remembering here and there. Um, but I got this book from Crean's uh, dad for Christmas called The Square Foot Garden, which I meant to have closer to me. I'll, I'll put it up in front of the camera a little bit later. Uh, great book. Uh, he's very much a zealot of his system, um, but it's a, it's a pretty nice uh, introduction to Something that can be applied pretty much anywhere. Um, you can do square foot gardening uh, in a regular uh, backyard, uh, but it seemed like a perfect solution for me. Um, we live in a, uh, a second floor with a little bit of a roof behind it um, that we have access to. And so, um, yeah, try. I'm gonna attempt, this is a work in progress. This might be a horrible failure this first year round. Um, we're gonna attempt to use uh, this process. So. Let me pull up a sketchbook here. I had meant to clear a whiteboard, which I'll be using in the future for uh, drawings. But really, the um, the advantage of a square foot garden is that in the past, when you do a traditional garden, traditional row gardens were essentially rows, obviously, which is why they call them row gardens. Where you'd have something like this. You have uh, rows of your of whatever uh, seeds you're growing, and they'd be in a straight line. And then you have these little pathways in between because this is the only way for you to get around uh, and through into water and to weed and all that other stuff. And you would just do that in whatever soil you had in your backyard. And uh, so there's a lot of reasons that this existed. And one of the cool things about this book is that he talks a little bit about. Well, this all started because everybody was a farmer. I mean, well, not everybody, but a lot of people on these lands were farmers that, that, you know, they wanted to go home and have a little garden for themselves with a little bit more diversity in terms of what they're eating. But when they went to work, they would go off into huge acreages of land. Um, and they would plant like this because it's the only way you can drive an ox, and, you know, drive an ox with a, you know, blade behind it or uh, till the soil or all other things you need to do in a, a mass farming environment. This would be the way that you do it. Um, there's lots of issues with this on a big scale like that. You have to, you know, if you've seen combines and all that other things, there's all sorts of things you have to do to keep up with a row scenario like that. But that's the most efficient way for a tractor, for animals, uh, load bearing things to, to get uh, through the soil. So that just got translated to um, essentially the small little plot of land behind your house, or small or large. It was a smaller uh, piece of space. Problem with that is that if that's your good soil that you've tilled up and made into this place where you're planting, um, you're using less than 50% of it to actually grow your crops. Worse than that, you're actually just stomping down all of these areas which is technically the same uh, quality of soil which is where you're walking so there's lots of wasted space there and uh, a traditional row uh, a traditional row environment you throw a ton of seeds down into the ground hoping that one or two every so often would sprout um, and it's sort of survival of the fittest mode uh, and because you're in large swaths of soil uh, your soil isn't as rich isn't as uh, as yummy to the plants. Um, so you uh, essentially have to over grow to get uh, a viable crop at the end of the year. So what the square foot garden does is, his whole concept is you can grow a ton more stuff in a more compact area if you, first of all, don't walk on the soil that you consider rich and um, you know, full of good stuff. And uh, instead, you sort of designate these smaller areas, but you put much better soil into them. 
So, you know, out in uh, the middle of the U.S., the soil's not actually that great. It's all right, and you know, and you can buy fertilizers and a bunch of other harmful chemicals that you probably don't want to be eating that make it technically better for the plants. Um, but with something like this, if you make a raised sort of uh, environment for um, your plants, you can essentially walk through this area. You know, uh, this is maybe the same amount of space as those three rows in the previous picture, but now you have. Uh, you know, first you have these uh, you have these big containers. These are not individual little storage units. This is just these are just little slats to divide the space into one foot um, areas. But you have you know basically a big, a relatively large uh, container of soil that you can actually put in exactly what you want in that soil. So rather than just having random dirt that's on the in the ground that has a ton of weeds, a ton of other things you don't want in your garden in them and that isn't that great of soil it might you know you might live in an area where there's a ton of clay you might if you're like me there's no soil because you're on, on a roof um, or you you know you could be in an area like the Gowanus which is not that far from here where you probably don't want plants in the ground because there's some nasty stuff uh, that has you know seeped out of factories over the years in this area um, so you can control the plot basically uh, so for roof gardening, it's great because you spend a day, you build these boxes, um, you put, you know, put some slats underneath them, drill some holes in them for water to get out, and then uh, you put your soil in there. That you know that can be a self-contained thing. Doesn't need any soil underneath it. Doesn't need any soil from the ground, um, and you're off and running, right? So if you control the soil, and he has a recipe for soil, I'll get into in a second, then you essentially control the quality of that soil. So you don't have to, you don't have to just dig the dirt out of the ground where you live, um, which has a ton of other stuff in it, maybe harmful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can, you know, actually get exactly what you need. Uh, you know, you can put compost, you can get the right quality of soil that breathes well, that allows oxygen in for the roots, um, that allows water to stay uh, in but not too, you know, it's not swampland, it's not a desert, basically. You can get the right composition. Um, and, you know, for my logical brain, I haven't, you know, actually extended this through the season to see how well this works. This seems like a really nice way to go. The other thing about this is because you're not doing row gardening and because you have the soil concentration that you like, if we do a top-down view of these plots, so if this is a squ if these are square foot plots from the top down, um, depending on the the vegetable or the flower or whatnot, um, you just divide the space up. So these slats that divide the the containers that you're putting the soil in, um, they essentially just work to give you some sort of visual way of dividing up the space. Um, and then based on the plant, you plant a, a, a different amount of them in, in those little plots. So let's say I wanted some cauliflower and some broccoli. Those are relatively big, um, big full-grown plants, right? They're, they're the, fruit, the fruit that they warrant is, you know, rather large. It's not fruit, it's vegetable, but the fruit of the plant is um, rather large. So you just, you know, cauliflower here, broccoli here. You just plant right in the middle of the square foot patch and it takes up that space. There's no weeds, there's no other stuff already in the soil, so it has free reign of that area. That's all the roots need. That's a good division of the space. You're off and running. If you want a ton of broccoli, you could put them in all, you know, four spots, whatever. Uh, you know, if you get, get into certain types of herbs, they might not take hardly anything, so you might be able to do three rows of three in this section. That one wasn't quite. So if you can see that, I don't know how far um, you know, I need to be for the resolution to be good, so do let me know. Uh, you know, you can divide that space into three by three by three. They're relatively, you know, distant, relative distance from each other in that one foot um, range, you know. So if you're doing something like, 
I'm trying to remember a good plant. I think if you do carrots or something, you can space your carrots like that because seed ends up being a carrot. It's relatively vertical in the ground. Uh, so there you go. You have nice division. When it starts growing, it's going to look great because you're going to have these different things in different areas. It's very easy to keep track of things. And because it's not in a row, because you have the soil concentration down the way you want, you don't have to put 80 seeds in each one of these plots. You put one, two, three, maybe at the most, in each of these holes. And then as soon as the dominant sprout is coming out of the ground, you, if there's other ones coming up, you snip them off. You let that dominant one in that particular dot of the, you know, that spot win and let it grow. It has no competition. It has no weeds to fight with. And uh, you know, you're off and running. So again, logical brain. Haven't done this yet. This is you know, part of my curiosity with this setup. Um, logically, it makes a lot of sense. There's no wasted soil that I'm stepping on. You don't step in these plots. These are self-contained units. If they're in a backyard of a garden, whatever, then they would be like your nice little planters that you, you know, decorate or whatever. And you kind of walk around them. They're like little set pieces of the of the, the backyard. So, <laughs> loudness elsewhere in the space. Um, so yeah, that's this is the general idea. So the only other thing really to know, and I'll post this later, um, his sort of secret ingredients for this, this whole thing is one-third vermiculite, one-third peat moss, and one-third, oh, this isn't going to work anyway because I have the text flipped here, so that might, it's easier for me to keep track of what side is what. Anyway, I'll write this anyway. One third vermiculite, one third peat moss, one third compost. Um, so the compost should be diversified. If you buy compost in a in a bag, it's probably going to be at least according to various people I've talked to and from the book. Um, your compost or your you, the compost from one industry gets put in a bag, so you might be at a sawdust plant and a, a lot of that extra um, refuse is put, you know, is sent off to be turned into compost so they can make a little money off of that extra. Um, but then the minerals in that compost are going to be kind of polarized in one direction. So you want to get five or more sources of compost for the compost part, okay? Um, that's, that's kind of the magic mix. Um, I went searching all over Brooklyn for this stuff. Turns out that um, it's relatively expensive to find uh, some of these things, um, especially the vermiculite, because people don't really use it. The, the, the breakdown of those three is that the peat moss like, is a nice um, airy, uh, has a nice airy, well, I might be getting vermiculite and peat moss confused here, because I'm no expert. Um, the vermiculite and the peat moss act as half sponge, half uh, ab absorber, right? So the one that's not absorbing the water uh, and holding it there for the the uh, the tender, you know, the roots thing, <laughs> uh, for the roots to uh, you know absorb. The other one is sort of letting in some oxygen, letting the air breathe or letting the ground breathe, so that the plant can get get what it needs. Um, and then the compost is sort of the mineral delivery uh, mechanism. So between those three, you got you, you got your air. You know, you, you're not you're not sloughing out the plant. That can happen in a in a row garden. That happened a lot with my parents. Um, the ground would get like way over tracked down, especially since I was a stupid kid and didn't care, and I would just run through the garden and stamp it down more. Um, so they'd have to you know do various things to aerate the ground throughout the season to make sure that you know they're also in a pretty clay happy environment. Um, so the soil just doesn't breathe as well. Uh, in some places, that's a big problem. So um, this you know, helps you get more oxygen in the soil. Helps you get more um, helps you get more uh, water to stay put, and then uh, it's getting nice vitamins to uh, the soil. And then you know, obviously, you put it in a nice place, and you read the instructions of the plant to make sure it's getting the right amount of sun. Um, and 
that's pretty much it. It's a pretty simple, uh, it's a pretty simple setup. So, um, yeah, I think that's the general gist of it. Uh, I'll, I'm just gonna switch over to the multiple cam for a second. Squareforgardening.com is sort of um, where you can get a ton of information there. Um, where I ended up going to get some of this stuff, uh, I was looking all at a whole bunch of uh, places, and I, I like bought all the vermiculite I could buy at the Lowe's um, to the point that I like went in yesterday again, and they were like, "Oh, we have a big slat in the back, but it, we don't know where it is. We we've been looking for you know I don't know. There, it's it's." It, you might be able to find a ton of it in your area. Uh, it was kind of expensive for me, but I did go to the Home Depot, and um, this guy that wrote the Square Foot Gardening book, um, Mel Mel Bartholomew, um, it is getting pretty popular. He has a, a nice organic mix uh, at that's being sold at Home Depot, uh, as well as like some some boxes that are sort of pre-made that you can put together really easily, um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, those are sort of just ready to go there. So uh, I got a little bit of extra um, compost from Korean's dad and got some other things already, but I just bought a bunch of those bags uh, and we'll see how that goes. Um, I mean, I think you, you, could, you could probably get away with buying other types of pre-mixed soil um, as well. Uh, I just, you know, it's the logical breakdown of the recipe seemed pretty nice to me. So uh, something to keep in mind. So this is the website for that, um, and you know there's a ton of resources uh, out there. There's a lot of people using this now, so uh, it's it's getting pretty popular. Um, so that's that's pretty much all there is to that. There's you know a lot of other idiosyncrasies, but I think you can find a lot more information there. Um, I'm excited to see how it works, and um, and yeah, I'm actually seeing a question from um, someone in the chat asking. Um, I've always been confused about when to start a garden. Any advice? That is a great question because I was very confused on that too and I kind of asked my parents about it but they're in a totally different region and their weather has been wacky. Uh, the weather in New York has been wacky too. Uh, I, I'm no expert again so um, what I've found so far is that if you go to, um, if you look up hardiness zones, um, you're gonna find uh, if you do a Google search on that, I, I forget what department of the U.S. government does this. It's ecology, maybe? I don't remember all that stuff. But um, you will find a map relatively quickly that shows the hardiness zones. I think it was updated actually last year, so that's good. Um, uh, since, you know, uh, global temperatures over the course of the year is changing quite a bit for, you know, reasons that we don't have to get into. Um, uh, hardiness zones will tell you sort of uh, what hardiness of plant to buy. Some plants will say, uh, Brooklyn for example is in 7B as far as I can tell is kind of, you know, looking at the map. Um, there's certain plants that you can, you know, when you buy the seeds or when you buy the plant, it'll say which, what hardiness zone is the, you know, extreme that it can handle. Um, so that's one way to do that. I'm sure you could find some, once you have that number in uh, at your disposal, you can um, use that to determine, uh, you know, do, do some lookup online for, uh, you know, referencing what kind of plants do what. Um, the other thing, uh, really, with plants is you want to, you don't want to plant them until the risk of frost is gone. Um, frost is going to kill off a lot of different types of plants. There's certain types of plants that don't care, uh, certain lettuces and hardier uh, plants like that. Um, don't care. You can put them in the ground uh, in March, and unless it's really cold, uh, you're going to be fine. There's certain plants, of course, that don't want as much sun. Uh, I mean, every, read the back of the packaging when you buy a plant. That's all I can say because I don't know all the. You know, I haven't been doing this for 20 years, so I don't have all that stuff uh, in in my head. Uh, but it is very regionalized. Uh, wait for the frost to go away. I think we're just getting to the point here in New York where in the evenings it's just over 40 degrees so um, frost is at freezing of course uh, a lot of plants seem to like uh, to be you know not dip the dip below 40 as a what I'm using as a general rule um, and uh, you know plants that have blooms on them 
the blooms are really, I, from my limited knowledge, what gets hurt when you um, when a frost hits. So that's something to to keep in mind. Um, and what I'm doing right now is I'm growing a lot of seedlings, things directly from seed in those little planters uh, that you can get uh, with some potting soil. I'm doing that inside, uh, letting them kind of get, get a little bit of a root system in them. And then, uh, you know, for a lot of these early May or, you know, late into April here in a week or two, uh, I'll, I'll throw them in the ground once I get everything finished outside. And it'll be a little bit warmer by then. So. Uh, I think that answers your question, hopefully, but I, I think it's one of those things that, one of the interesting things about gardening for me is that you kind of, even for like, for perennials, if you start growing a perennial, it's not even going to blossom the first year, like you're, you're not even going to see the fun part of the plant or the smelly part of the plant or the edible part of the plant until the next year, at least with a lot of them. Um, so, you know, you... Uh, you kind of have to stick with it for a while in, in the area that you're in. Um, so for uh, a, a person like me that likes to move, likes to change my location, my scenery, um, I'm interested in this square foot garden thing because it does mean that I can move the garden next year if I need to. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think it comes from experience in your, in your area. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, <clears throat> which I just forgot again. Oh, is when you when you harvest a plant, you might be able to get a few things in through the course of a spring, summer, fall uh, time. Uh, you know, let's say you're done with with all the carrots in that plot. Um, what this method says to do is have some compost, some raw compost on hand, whether you're making it yourself, whether you buy it, whatever, um, and put a couple shovelfuls in once you pull the plant and the root system out of that plot, and then that sort of re rejuvenates that area and um, you're ready to go with your next your next thing if you have like a fall harvest plant or something that you can do uh, then you're you're ready to go or if you're winterizing the, the space um, you know you can either do that before you winterize it or you can pull all the plants and then make a note to put some fresh compost in first thing when you uh, get started in the spring so that uh, I'm gonna that was actually a little more than uh, 20 minutes, it's more like 30 minutes. I'm gonna have to work on that a little bit. I'm gonna take a five minute break uh, and set up for, we're gonna talk a little bit about Teensies, which are kind of like a little electronic uh, guy that you can use to um, do certain things, um, do sort of fun uh, electronic things, which I'll get into in a second. So uh, yeah, take a break, come back in five minutes and uh, we'll get started with that. All right, so uh, welcome back. Uh, jumping into the next section. I'm seeing that I'm getting an ad um, on Justin TV, so I apologize if you're getting that as well. Well, you won't know, because you won't hear this. Um, so jumping into this next section, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, physical computing, which will be an ongoing topic here. And, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Teensy is one of the things that I put on uh, the list of things to vote about. Um, and sorry, let me move this one little ad out of the way. It's so nice of them for them to put that uh, put that there for me. Um, so I apologize if you're hearing that noise. I don't know exactly what's going on with my phone here. Too much technology on my desk. Okay, so. Um, uh, physical computing. Good God. Sorry, I have no idea if you can hear that. But it is all over my headphones, so I'm moving that out of the way. Hopefully that will take care of that issue. Okay. Um, physical computing. For most of you that are here, you probably know what it's about from um, what I can see in the chat. Um, it's a way to, uh, you know, if you've ever been into uh, a museum to uh, some sort of interactive exhibit or interactive art thing. It's becoming more and more of a um, cool thing to do. Uh, it's becoming easier and easier to do all of the time. In fact, um, 
this is plugged into my computer, it's extremely easy to, uh, you know, set this little guy up and use it to uh, turn on lights, to move motors, to do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and there's all sorts of great classes happening all over the country that are, are using these things. Uh, I think one, I have to not knock everything off my desk. Move back here so I can grab one of these. There's a variety of different um, different types of these out on the market these days. Uh, so you can't have a talk about physical computing without talking about the Arduino uh, because it's essentially, uh, you know, overtaken the hobbyist and even uh, the professional uh, market. Unless you're making your own board, a lot of people are using these. Um, this is an older one. Uh, but the general shape and size and um, weight is all the same. Uh, very, you know, this actually has, you'll see a, a bigger chip on it. This is the core, you know, brains of the of the device. Newer ones will have uh, a surface mounted piece or a, a small little guy like that that's, uh, you know, has to be soldered on. This is actually in a little piggyback configuration that you can pull out. Um, this is an example of one that SparkFun made. This is uh, essentially the same type of board. It's got a little bit of a different USB thing that you can plug, unplug. This is even old for SparkFun now. They have a bunch of different types. Um, you can essentially program this, hook a battery pack up to it through this nice little Molex uh, connector. Um, this isn't even soldered here, but there's a little row of pins, much like with the Teensy. Pull this out of the board here. Uh, it's really in there. So you can see there's little feet on that, easy to put into a uh, into a breadboard uh, or solder into other other uh, terminal connections. So there's a bunch of these out now. There's also a bunch of shield. This is a really ugly, <laughs> ugly shield that I pulled off of an install a while back that had a couple of transistors on it and all that. Um, and as you can see, all the Arduinos in this box are from different time periods, they have slightly different colors to them, they have slightly different parts on them. Um, Arduino is really a really great platform, it's open source, it's a really nice example of um, open source hardware, which has become uh, uh, an, an emerging like area of interest uh, for me and for a lot of people um, in that, you know, you can make a device that you can sell, you can make money, the Arduino guys are making, uh, you know, decent amount of money making these. They also open source uh, what the boards look like, the layout of the boards, the code that runs on this. Um, and you program this with a nice uh, cross-platform uh, uh, development environment, or IDE, um, that you know is open source. So if you wanted to tweak it, if you wanted to make it something different, you can. And that's essentially what these Teensy guys did. And you know they didn't open source it as much as the Arduino guys did, but um, it's. Uh, I think this is a, this is a board worth talking about for a few reasons. The newer Arduinos have actually um, changed up what they do a bit. I think in response to what these guys did, which is that they they essentially made a board that works with the Arduino programming environment. Which, uh, if we jump over here to the multiple cam, you'll see. Um, you'll see uh, here's the Arduino page. Uh, this there's a, there's a bunch of different uh, things. I, I would say you're going to learn a ton more by going here than ever through listening to me for a half hour. Um, you know, talk on and on, um, ramble at, at many many points in time. <laughs> you're going to get a lot more out of uh, going through the learning here, going through the references. Um, finding their wiki, uh, people have pretty much found ways to connect pretty much everything to this, whether it's a, a hacky solution or a very direct protocol that they, they figured out. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's just a wealth of information here. Um, so, yeah, the Teensy guys essentially made this board. This is a close-up, uh, you know, nice view of it versus my shaky hands. Um, they have two different versions. The newer Arduinos do a lot of the stuff that these guys do, but the nice thing about the Teensies obviously by their name. Very small. Um, something just ejected, probably the Teensy. Um, they're very small. They uh, run off of a um, 
a smaller version of the uh, USB cable. So uh, nice thing about that, get, get up there, yeah, tiny, nice and tiny. There's smaller ones on the Kindle, for example, and things, but um, you know this is about as small as you can get. Um, nice, low profile. It does everything that the Arduino does. Um, it also does a couple of things that the Arduino is still kind of catching up on. And I think they're relatively close now. It can, uh, you know, USB devices can generically em uh, emulate a um, generically emulate a keyboard. Uh, a, a mouse, there's like generic profiles for those, so essentially what that means is you don't have to, when you plug it in, you don't have to install drivers or other sorts of things to uh, interact with it. Uh, those are called HID devices, um, human interface devices. There's a bunch of different types of them. If you ever try to read uh, USB documentation, it is thousands and thousands of pages and there's thousands of profiles of USB devices anything you can imagine they kind of uh, if you look at if you're looking at specifications of, of things if you look at the MIDI specification which is a specification that was created in the 60s or 70s for uh, having musical instruments ele electronic music instruments talk to each other super simple spec it's, a f it's like five ten pages has a couple of weird little caveats but very simple pretty easy to set up uh, on a breadboard with discrete parts with like, you know, really low level parts like a resistor, for example. Um, you know, the hardest thing you need in a MIDI circuit is an opto isolator, which I don't even get into what that is right now. Um, but with a USB device, you have to have like a USB driver, you have to have all this other stuff. Um, HID devices essentially gave you a nice open access point that's generic. So if you want to make a keyboard, you can get a HID compliant chip that you interface your microcontroller with or your Teensy with, and um, then it can send commands that act like a key like keyboard presses, or essentially would connect the buttons that are in your keyboard with that chip, which then sends it out over the generic HID um, keyboard format, and then you can type. You know. Um, and that, al that allowed uh, you know, manufacturers to make a lot of different types of keyboards, same with the mouse. Um, so essentially, initially when you plug in an Arduino or a Teensy, you're not going to have that for free. You, uh, you, you might have to uh, install a USB to serial, uh, USB to serial driver uh, specific to the Arduino. Some of these older Arduinos you have to install an FTDI um, driver. Some of the newer ones it's uh, a little easier to do. Um, yeah, it's not so straightforward to do that. So HID devices are nice. You know that you can plug them into a Mac, PC. The drivers are going to be there. You're ready to go. Uh, it's also fun to uh, you know have some switches on the ground that act as your keyboard. If you're doing uh, interactive things and say Flash or um, some of these other uh, visual, you know, not visual programming languages, but visual programming languages would be, uh, you know, a potential thing uh, where it's easier to get keyboard commands in because all of those programs look at the keyboard, uh, whereas you're not going to get that. Like in Flash, you're not going to be able to talk to a discrete device that's very um, specific. Uh, as easily, if at all. Uh, there's lots of weird workarounds that people have had to do over the years to make that happen. So, being able to emulate a device, very cool. Not always useful. You might have to send a ton of data out of one of these, and you need to use serial or some other protocol, which we're not really discussing today. Um, this is very just introductory. So, if you guys want more later, then I'll be happy to talk about more. Um, so, yeah. Going back to uh, the view here, uh, yeah, I mean, there's two different types. There's a lot of different types of in input pins that can be used as um, as buttons if you want a very tactile, uh, direct, on and off sort of state. Uh, a few of these pins can be used for analog, which means you can get a range of values if you have a knob or a slider or something like that, where you want the precise, uh, you know, precise level uh, that that potentiometer that 
what this live stream is actually named after, variable resistance being a variable amount of resistance in a, uh, a variable resistor uh, or a potentiometer, things like that. Um, those types of things are, of course, a whole nother discussion. Um, again, very simple introduction. Uh, very nice. They're the size of a stamp. You'll see this other uh, board on here, spark fun part, also a little bit older, probably a little more refined now. This tiny little black thing is an accelerometer, very similar to what you have in your phone. Uh, if you have a smartphone, most every smartphone has one of these now. They might also have a gyrometer in them. Um, you can kind of measure uh, how much something's being pushed in one direction or another direction on uh, multiple you know, axes. Uh, so that's just an example of something that you could you could then take the variable resistance out of that and plug it directly into the Teensy and read those values and very quickly make some sort of Wii-like, Wiimote-like device that you could uh, have fun with. Um, and you know, vice versa. These things here at the end are um, transistor arrays, very small transistor arrays. Um, Transistors can amplify the power that comes out of these, and you can send them to motors, um, to actuators, various different things. Um, and then, you know, if you want to get really fun, you can. This is just what I had next to me since I did not prepare as much for this particular section today. Um, you know, you can get something like this where you have a little. Um, let's see if I can actually zoom in on that a little bit you actually have uh, you know an element that would uh, attach to your surface to your wood whatnot oh, let me flip back to the game cam here so you can see this a little easier uh, you have a surface that you know you could uh, attach to wood to aluminum to your enclosure whatever uh, and some sort of axle that you could push it this is for a lamp that I'm working on or have been working on for a while um, and you have uh, a nice little uh, gear here, which attaches to a nylon chain, right? So you could attach the other end of this. You could attach this end to uh, a piece of wood or something that you're turning. In my case, it's a piece of wood that's a little bit of a lamp. Um, if you, you know, the other end of this would also have sort of a spoke system that's connected to the motor. So then you could turn that, you could connect that to a servo, um, which, you know, just rotates something a little bit so that you only get a certain amount of rotation between those things. Um, lots of things you can do. Uh, also outside the scope of today, but um, could be something we talk about more later in the future. So yeah, that's a really, really simple introduction. I'm sorry if it's not as much as some of you guys were hoping for um, into the Teensy. Uh, it's a really handy device. I, I like it just because you can I mean, you can practically, you could cut a little hole in the book in the chapter that you don't like and hide it uh, completely and, and you know, have a little interactive book at your disposal. Um, with a little uh, NICAD or lithium battery connected to it, it'll run for quite a while. And uh, you can sense things in space. You can, the world's your oyster. There's all sorts of fun things you could do. Um, so yeah. That's Teensy. Uh, I'll probably be showing more specific things with that in the future. I might show a little bit about that lamp that I've been building, um, especially once it's finished and I can show it off a bit. Um, I'm noticing that I'm probably blurred out on you guys. Apologies on that. Um, but yeah, that's. I think that's what I've got for today. Uh, sorry if this has been rough in spots. This is my first week. I'm still getting the kinks. Uh, ironed out. I'm hoping to have some smoother transitions between some of the cameras in the future, um, have uh, some more information on screen, uh, hoping to use a whiteboard in the future which I can write on back here and since the camera's flipped it'll show up correctly for you. Um, so lots of fun things to come. If you guys have anything you would like to know more about, if there's anything that you are curious about, um, I'll probably end up being curious about it too. Um, and would love to explore it and uh, start a discussion about it uh, in this forum. 
I'm also hoping variable resistance.org, which is where I'm hoping to put show notes and the archived versions of uh, the videos, either on YouTube or Vimeo to be decided, or Blip, something like that. Um, I'll be putting things there, um, hoping for some discussion there eventually. Uh, now, of course, as well. Uh, it's it's uh, still very ugly, um, but I'm trying not to focus on aesthetics too early and focus instead on the content. So, um, yeah, so uh, leave some comments if you have comment either here in the, in, uh, you can send me an email um, at jeff at grayfuse.com. Uh, I'll be setting up a email for this as well in the future, but that's what I've got for now. And uh, that's all I've got for today. So thank you for tuning in, and um, yeah, feel free to contribute uh, in any way you'd like. If, you, if you're uh, an expert on a topic or a generalist on a topic and you'd like to be a guest, um, let me know. We'll Skype you in, or I'll bring you down here if you're uh, in the local Brooklyn area and um, share the knowledge around. So thanks a lot for coming, and uh, I'll see you next week, hopefully.